Some of the decisions that you've made that have gotten you to this point, in fact, almost all of them has been, have been conscious decisions. Um, people generally handle things um, in an emotional way. So any decision that you're making, whether you think you're making it rationally or not, it's still an emotional process for you. And that's because either you have inherited filters that have come through your parents, your grandparents, which means they thought a certain way, um, which means they were prejudiced towards chocolate cake over white cake, so to speak. They had a preference for it. And so you learned all of these through, and, and, and you acquired all these filters, and some of them you inherited, and they inherited, and they inherited sort of thing. But you also, what you also do is when you make decisions on things, and I'm sorry, I'm to your side. I like That's to fine. look at everybody. When you make decisions on things, they become a part of your DNA. And when, they, when they're stored, you store them with the emotion that you were dealing with when you made the decision. And this is why, and, and even in our family we'll do it, and it's the most hilarious thing because you'll be, you'll be talking about something that happened in the family and every single person will see it differently. And, 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 and you'll say, you know, what family did you grow up in? Because that's not the way it happened. And it's because when you have these strong memories, they're stored with your emotion that you had at the time. So someone might be having the best experience and someone else might not. And so this emotion is, is what brings up. And, and the interesting thing about it is that you can actually, you can actually change your, your experiences from the past. You can go back in and you, you can recall the emotion and you can actually change the emotion and file it back again, which is, I'm sure, part of what Molly does. But this workshop is very different because it's more about creativity than about how to use your pastels or how to use your watercolors or how to use your oil paints. Because that's, that's, the, that's the vehicle and you're the driver. So what that means is that that's, that's the way for you to get your emotions out and your creativity out. But the actual process doesn't happen at the end of a brush. It happens up here. And so what we're going to address today is we're going to address what happens up here so that when you go out there, you can take advantage of the filters and not fight them. You, you have a left brain, right brain thing going on. Your left brain is what? drives most of the things you do during the day. It helps you function during the day. Your left brain lets you get into a car and not have to learn how to drive the car every, every single time you get into the car. So your left brain is really your friend, but it's also very dominant in a lot of people. Charlie and I are, 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 are very right-brained, and so it's, it's, it's more of a process for us to deal with everyday little things than it is for us to deal with the big picture. She says that, but I... I my brain cells that I don't have to much left. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's to do with that, right? <laughs> so, so what you what you have to do is, and what I've had to do is, you have to kind of make peace with your left brain because your left brain is is really just trying to help you. It's it's trying to help you do things efficiently. So, for instance, if you were trying to do something like like draw that table, you know that there's four sides to that table and that's left brain. But your right brain, you're looking at it and you're seeing three sides or two sides. So when you go to put something like that on a canvas, your left brain, because it's so dominant, wants to say to you, you already know how to do that. You already know that that chair has four legs. And people will actually paint the four legs even though they don't see them. And then they look at it and go, why, why doesn't that look realistic? So you have to kind of you have to quiet your left brain in a kind way, though, because your, your left brain doesn't like being told what to do. It, it's the boss. You know, it's the one that does your income tax for you. It's the one that does your accounting. It's the one that follows a recipe for you. I never follow recipes. Charlie can tell you that. He'll, he'll say, what's for dinner? I'll say, it's a surprise because I don't know what it's going to look like till it comes out. But um, make friends with your left brain and, and, and make sure that 
your left brain actually knows which is part of you. I'm not talking like it's another person. It's not that kind of thing. But it's part of you and it's a functioning part of you that's very helpful. But you, ha you have to make sure that, that consciously and unconsciously you know it's okay to let go a little bit with the left brain so that you can let the right brain come in. And it's the right brain that's going to take advantage in a good way of all the filters that you have because your filters are not bad. Your filters are what make you you, and you know what they say, you know, be yourself because everybody else is taken. So what, what I'm gonna do in this workshop with you is I'm going to watch everything that you do for the first day and a half because I want you to be totally yourself. It, even in photography, um, Charlie is very conscious of when he takes someone's photograph, he's very conscious of having the person come through. And so he'll watch their gestures and he'll watch the way you sit and he'll 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 watch the way you react to things and, and not pose people so that people look like who they are to everybody so i'm going to do the same thing i'm going to i'm going to watch what you do and it, this has nothing to do with the level that you're at and just to give you an example every four or five years i'll look at different artists that i've been admiring people that are either doing something really different or people that are wonderful colorists or something like that. And every five years, I will go and take a professional workshop. And I just did that this past spring. And for a lot of reasons, I, I, I've been doing workshops for many, many years. And what I wanna do is I wanna put myself in your place, what it's like to go to a workshop, what it's like to, um, to be an adult and to put yourself in a vulnerable space and, and I, I also want to see what it's like from the instructor's point of view, from another instructor, you know, how they handle students, how they, you know, how they, how they communicate with students and things. And so um, I was able to do it this, this spring. And, and I, what I find is it doesn't matter what type of workshop you do, who you do workshop from, you're going to get something from it. If you go in there with an open mind, you can't not, even if the, even if you even if you don't like the work that the instructor is doing, even if you have no intention of ever painting like that instructor, you'll still gain something from the workshop, and it will bring you one step forward to where you want to go. So, what we're going to do um, this week is um, we're going to do a lot of uh, concept work, which means outdoors is is one of the best places for you to filter all this stuff because when you're standing there and you're looking at something not only is everything going through your filters but you're here and, and the wind is blowing your hair you're smelling the sea you're hearing the seagulls and all this stuff is in the background the same as it is every day like me telling you about standing in front of the falls and you don't realize the roar that's going on because you're filtering out all that stuff but it's all going in subconsciously and so all of that stuff ends up being in your painting so when you're outdoors, Mother Nature is the best teacher, the best teacher as far as lighting, incredible lighting outdoors that you can't get from looking at a photograph, incredible color outdoors that you can't get from looking into a photograph. But I won't go into the photograph stuff because Charlie and I both have master's degrees in photography and I understand the limitations of doing an image and trying to print it on a paper. It's, it's, it's like taking an original and diluting it, every generation loses something to go from, for us, from film or from digital to a paper. The paper can only handle so much information and so forth, so I won't get into all that. But we're, here you are, you're, you're in a first generation situation. So you're emotional, I, I hope you're emotional, I hope you're excited about being here at this workshop and I hope you're excited about what you see on the island and the weather, I mean, how great is this? Like, didn't yeah. it just go up like 20 degrees in the mm -hmm. past? So we're gonna take advantage of all of that and, and all of that's gonna end up in your painting. So I'm not about detail. You see my paintings here. I'm about what's going on in the, in, in the environment that I'm in. And so um, one, of the, one of the other things that we're gonna do is um, we're gonna do value plans so that when you're outdoors today, there are no clouds right now, but there could be clouds in an hour. So when you're doing stuff outdoors, you have to be aware of the fact that probably within 20 or 25 minutes, your lighting pattern's gonna change. So when we come onto a location, what I will be doing is I will be showing you, okay, I chose this location because, 
first off, it's going to be because of the weather. Okay, so that we're all comfortable. We're 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 you know relatively out of harm's way as far as the weather goes. Um, the other thing is, I'm going to tell you about lighting. So um, this is it's going to help you when you get on location someplace. Um, you could be in the most beautiful place in the world. I could be painting in Niagara, and if I'm there at the wrong time of day, all I'm going to have is the equivalent of a picture postcard. I'm not going to have a painting that has incredible lighting. On the other hand, I could be walking through a hallway in any one of these old buildings, and there could be a, an old pair of galoshes sitting next to a window with a light beam coming in, and you could do a painting of that, and it would be the most incredible painting in in the world. The, the lighting would be incredible. So it's all about lighting. So when you go out to look for something and we're on location, I'll say, okay, I chose this because, and the first thing I usually go for is light. So I'll look at what the light's doing first. And then I'll look at what the light is doing to the composition. Because your composition in flat light is going to be way different than your composition with the proper light on it because with the proper light on it, you're gonna have highlights, you're gonna have cast shadows, and they're all part of your composition. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so your, your composition, meaning the shapes within, will change because your cast shadow will become part of the shape. So we'll go into a lot of that during the painting process. But I, I wanna get to a location and tell you exactly why I picked what I picked so that like, he wants me to show you his photograph here. To, to do something of this building flat gives me the effect of a rendering of the building. To do something with this is telling a story of what's, you know, you'll say, okay, it's, it's this time of day. Mm -hmm. I have, there's a, a group in uh, Canada called the Group of Seven. I know in, in the U.S. it was a group of eight, but the group is seven. And I have a friend that's a uh, uh, severe weather meteorologist, and he used to do uh, talks all over Canada and the U.S. for Environment Canada. And the group of seven were outdoor painters, and he, and he, he would give the talk, and he would be able to tell you by what the clouds were doing, what time of day it was, what, what time of year it was, mm -hmm. just that, by looking at the paintings. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and the other thing is, if you see how, how Charlie's done this, ch this part is flat, but, the, but this is secondary to what he's doing. So your subject itself, if you, if, you, if you come up to a subject and you wanna do, paint a subject, it could be a tree, say it's a tree, and it's just a tree, nothing else, just a tree with a flat field. If you paint the tree head on, with, with the field, there, there's a, um, I'm sure you've heard of feng shui. There's, there's a, uh, a mental process that for you to get into the painting and move around in the painting, you actually, you, you, it, there's a, a barrier that you have to get over to be able to get into the painting or the photograph and move around in it, you know, the chi that moves through, the energy that moves through. If you, if you move to the side and, 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 and you give yourself a three-quarter view, automatically what happens that in some parts you're going to get a diagonal. And the diagonal is, think of it as a road or a river or a path. or so, And that's what lets your eye get into the painting or the photograph and move around. So in this case, Charlie's done it with lighting here where he's got you going directly to this, even though this is the smallest part of his photograph. What happens in a composition is minority gets the attention. So if, if say if I was doing, some people, people think it's color. It's color in a way, but it's color in a, in a way with compliments. In the way of minority gets the attention, suppose this was, and I'll give you the best example I can think of, suppose this was a big bushel of red apples you were looking at. You were looking down into big, bright red apples, which is very bright color, right? You'd think that would be dominant, correct? Suppose you were to take a little lime and stick it in the corner of those red apples. Where would your eye go? Minority gets the attention. 
So in a composition, there's a lot of ways that you, that you can call people's attention because what you're doing is when you get out there and we're working with squares, so it's going to be a little bit different. When you get out there, and I'll tell you why I'm working with a square. When you get out there, you're, all you're doing is designing within these four corners. Okay? If your purpose is you're thinking to go out there and to make that look like the best island in that you can do, I can take a mirror and I can put it in front of that and I can reflect every bit of detail in that hotel to make it look like the best island in. But that's not a work of art. The work of art comes from you. It comes through your filters. It, writer, it doesn't matter visual artists, writers. Writers have every word that's available in the dictionary in their novel. It might be bestseller on the New York Times list. But the dictionary is not a literary work of art. So it's, it's when the human process comes through it. And what do writers do anyway? Think about what the, what the most powerful thing is that you can communicate with. It's an image. Because even a writer will use words to conjure up an image. So images are the most powerful thing you can communicate with. It's, it's, it, visual artists have held communities together. They've revived communities. They've been used in, um, I don't want to sound depressing here, but they've been used in camps. Um, people hold on to images. It helps them survive. It helps them thrive. It gets them through stress. And so if you think about it that way, the, the image comes through your mind. You know, it comes through all of your filters. That's why when you, when you guys start painting, every single one of your paintings is going to have a different style. And if I take that day and a half to get to see what you're doing, I can point out your strengths. I'm not going to point out your weaknesses because your weaknesses are only things where your left brain is, is trying to come back in because you already know everything that you need to know about painting or making images. All I, all I can try to show you is how to get out of your own way so that you can stay in right brain and, and you can trust what's coming through. And um, I'm going to be like that little mosquito, you know, because if I go around and I look at what's going on and you're in right brain, and it, saying, I'm saying right brain, but I just mean you're in your, you're in your creative mode, um, sometimes I won't even say anything to you because you'll be going in the right direction. However, if I see you do one tiny little thing that's reversing for you, I'll point it out so that you're more aware of when that happens the next time. But for the most part, you're here to find yourself, to find your creativity, to get to a point where you can, you can call it up yourself. You, you, don't, you don't need to be in a class. And for, as far as what you absorb this week, um, it's like anything, I, I tell the story, and this is going back a long time, my VCR always flashes 12 because you can only, you can only absorb so much. And so you'll absorb stuff during this, this workshop, and I'll say the same things over and over again because every time you hear them, you'll, you'll hear something that takes you a little half step further. And even if I'm saying it to somebody else, Everybody has one of those in there, yeah. So, pardon? Oh, that's, yeah, this is our student arriving from California right now, yes. Um, so where was I? So I'm saying about um, creativity. So um, my whole point with getting you into right brain is to um, get you a little bit closer to your core because... I'm going to interrupt Jacqueline. She's going to get me a the but... Lots of times when I hear people from uh, return to, to our class and stuff like that, from a couple days later, that they say, oh, I'm not getting anything. Uh, then a few days later, she says, that's exactly what she's been talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, in a couple minutes, you're going to have this incredible experience with uh, Dr. Delaney here. <laughs> and um, 
Molly and I have work, been working, we, we, we met each other about seven years ago, I think we've been working together about six years now, specifically with the Monhegan Workshop, because there's no better place than Monhegan to be able to absorb all this wonderful energy. And by the way, the, the, um, about two weeks ago, I realized this was going to be a diva workshop. Yeah. And I'm so excited to have all women. Stop.